Good morning. It's 8.30, and I'm going to call the Clay County Board of Commissioners meeting for August 27, 2024, to order. First order, or first item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. A motion to approve the agenda as presented, Mr. Chair. No second. A motion to second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Next is citizens to be heard. Do we have any citizens that are here that want to address any issue that's not on the agenda? Steve, do we have anybody remotely? Oh, we do not, Mr. Chair. Okay. Next, approval of payments of bills and vouchers. I'll move the uh, approve the uh, bills and vouchers. Second. Okay, I have a motion to second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Next, we have approval of minutes from August 13th, 2024. Move we uh, approve the minutes from August 13th. Second. Motion to second. Any changes or discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. Next up, we have Kurt Cannon, Veteran Service Officer, and he is here to, on a request to hire an assistant. Morning, Kurt. Morning, Chair, Commissioners. Uh, just uh, here today to request the approval to start the hiring process to replace uh, the administrative assistant in our office due to retirement uh, uh, October 17th. Is it? Day. That's her anniversary date. So, any questions for Kurt? I'd entertain a motion. Move to approve. A motion to second. Any further discussion? And we're going to let Kurt off easy. <laughs> I knew this, this one would be easy, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. Okay. Next up, and we're a little bit ahead of the schedule here, budget presentation, Lake Agassiz Regional Library. Two minutes early. Um, I think we're seven minutes early. Seven minutes early. Can you okay. Do, committee assignment? Yeah. Uh, let's go ahead. If Commissioner Mojo, I believe, is starts here. Oh, here we go. Morning, Liz. Come on up and have a seat. <laughs> 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 Have Liz Lynch for Lake Agassiz Regional Library. I'm like just walking in. <coughs> <laughs> we we move the meeting right along here. A little bit about. Lake Agassiz Regional Library and to answer any questions you might have. Um, just as a reminder, Lake Agassiz Regional Library provides public library service in uh, seven counties and we have 22 locations within those seven counties. Our mission is to enrich lives and strengthen communities and I'll start out by Sorry, I literally ran up those stairs. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, I'll start out by giving you an update on Barnesville, Holly, and Newland, of course. So, um, when I was here last year, I do believe that I shared that Lake Agassiz Regional Library received a grant for 
$30,000 from the Otto Bremer Trust. And this was to update the interior of the Barnesville Public Library. <coughs> and then in addition, the Barnesville Area Community Fund um, and the Friends of the Library jumped on board and raised an additional $25,000. And so with those funds, we were able to get new carpet, paint, furnishings, shelving. We're still waiting for a couple of items to arrive, but um, I do have to give a shout out to the Clay County Sentence to Serve program. They were so helpful. They um, removed everything from the library so that we could paint and carpet and then brought everything back in again. And we've used that program a couple of times. So helpful, so appreciative of that service. Um, also, another bit of news regarding the Barnesville Public Library. We have had um, the branch librarian there, Carol Van Brocklin, she has been there since 2015 and she is now retiring. And so we will be having an open house for her on September 7th from 10 to noon and everyone is welcome to attend. Um, the business at the Holly Public Library is going strong and it is um, in just the first six months of the year, circulation of the physical materials or the checkout of items is up by 16% and um, over the same time last year. And um, recently, an employee from our headquarters in the lower level of the Moorhead Public Library um, had spent a day at the Holly Public Library. And um, when she returned from working on this project, she sent this really, really great email about her experience at the Holly Public Library. And um, she basically said that every computer in the library was in use by adults and children during that entire time. She talked about um, a mother who had a toddler who was playing in a, um, with to age appropriate toys provided by the library. There were school aged children with this mother as well who were checking out books. There were kids, a group of kids working on a Where's Waldo scavenger hunt. And the librarian was also helping adult patrons navigate through um, the interlibrary loan service, which is a service that we offer where you can obtain books or materials from anywhere in the state of Minnesota or really anywhere in the United States by using your local public library. And um, when she returned, she, this was my favorite part of her email, she said, on my drive in and out of Holly, I saw a total of one person on the street, yet the library was teeming with life. And in the midst of it all was an enthusiastic, engaging, approachable Melissa who has made the library the hub of the community. And honestly, this is just a day in the life of the Holly Public Library. So Melissa Larson does a great job. In Newland, um, Amy Nelson is the link site coordinator. She's known for going above and beyond in that community. I don't know if you know Amy, but she is fantastic. And um, she does such an excellent job of connecting with the schools, the businesses, and different agencies. And the link site is housed in the um, Newland Community Center. I drove through there the other day and noticed they have received a facelift and it looks it looks fabulous, um, but I know that the community of Ulan benefits not only from the services offered by Laurel, but really from Amy's ability to connect with that community. So um, that was the Barnesville, Holly, and Ulan locations. And then of course, there's the Moorhead Public Library. As far as signatories go, the Moorhead Public Library does fall under the city of Moorhead, but of course, thousands of Clay County residents use the Moorhead Public Library, both residents from inside the city and outside the city. And of course, there's a lot of excitement regarding the new public library. We're so excited that the Laurel headquarters will also be in this new community center facility. Um, this is really gonna be an amazing resource for the residents of Moorhead and for the surrounding area. With all this excitement in the air, the Moorhead Public Library, the current Moorhead Public Library is really 
busier than ever. Um, already this year, they've checked out over 100,000 items, which is fabulous, and they've issued over 1,500 new library cards to residents. And um, I work in the lower level of the Moorhead Public Library, and as I walk to my office and from my office, <coughs> I am always thrilled to see how many people are using that library. Um, regarding the budget, all of you should have a copy of our request. Um, we are asking for a total request from all of the signatories. It's a 1.77 increase. This increase is simply to maintain current services. The board did choose this lower increase of 1.77 because we do have healthy reserves right now. Um, the one problem that we are currently dealing with is very low wages for frontline staff. Um, in 2024, a library assistant position, which is a position where you check in items, check out items, shelve materials, help customers and assist with programming, that position starts at 1317 per hour and our branch librarians who are responsible for operating our locations such as Holly and Barnesville start at 1619 and um, these employees do a lot for their communities and they're really serving customers of all ages with all types of needs. We um, are in a position where both hiring and retaining staff is very difficult. We will be entering union negotiations next week, or excuse me, next month. And um, we usually, during union negotiations, negotiate on a three-year contract. And so we really are hoping to make some progress on wages, which would not necessarily be reflected in the request for 2025 but would be reflected in the 2026 and 2027 requests. Does anyone have any questions? I'm, I've just got an observation. I'm on the negotiating team for this upcoming contract. And it really resonates the, the approach that we've got here with our employees is we find the means to keep our uh, level of compensation competitive with other other job other industries and other communities and I think right now the library is looking at that down the road and it may result in a bigger ask mm -hmm. and I'll be blunt about it because I, I don't have to be diplomatic from this position but it's worth it we're moving into a, a uh, situation it's not just the Moorhead Library this entire county benefits from the services of Lake Agassiz and um, down the road it we, you know we may be asked all the participants may be asked to come up with a, a an ability to respond to the salary issues that we're looking at now anybody have any questions or yes Steve mr. Chair, so Liz you'd mentioned uh, some healthy reserves would uh, from through the negotiation portion for 2025 would you be anticipating utilizing some of those reserves um, after the negotiations and then and then in 26 come come to our yes okay yep mm -hmm. any other questions well thanks Liz we appreciate you running up here for us well um, I am supposed to be training for a relay um, and apparently I need to do some more training. <laughs> it took me a while to catch my breath there. So Our stairs are always at your disposal. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. But you were early nonetheless. Yes. I mean, okay. We were, we were early, but as were you. So. All right. Thank you so much. Take care now, Liz. Next up, Quinn Jagger. Jagger. I keep sticking the E in there, man. You got it. Our social service director. Perfect. 
Good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I am going to grab Megan, who I believe is outside. She's going to help me with this. Okay. Paul should have Megan Jensen. Um, we just wanted an opportunity to come here. I know there were some questions about the Family Resource Center a few board meetings back, and I thought it would be a good opportunity for Megan and I to come to board and just give you an update on kind of the progress of where the project is. Um, so I will kick it over to Megan for the presentation. Um, I guess at any point in time, if you have questions, feel free to let us know. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you for the time this morning. I'm Megan Jensen with Creating Community Consulting. I'm co-owner. Um, we are a team of 10 <clears throat> that started in 2022. Um, we mainly work throughout Clay County and Becker County as that is where our staff live. Um, and really when we think about creating community, it's important to be connected in the community and know the community well to do that. And so um, just a little bit about us, um, we've actually had a number of contracts with Clay County. Um, this one that we're talking about today, the Family Resource Center is funded through the Sauer Family Foundation. Um, our role is funded 100% through that grant um, for the pre-implementation work. That's a very unique grant that allows for capacity building. Um, we have also worked with Clay County Social Services in uh, looking at addressing child care through West Central Initiatives Grant, um, as well as a few projects with um, Clay County Public Health in relation to health equity. And so um, our our team is really just meant to help support capacity building. We work with a lot of county entities, city entities, and then nonprofits, really in helping to um, do some of the work that is really hard uh, when staff are busy doing their normal jobs. And so we've really come in to help with planning, um, getting partners to rally around uh, a common goal, um, a lot of listening sessions and getting input from families and community members to ensure that all decisions are uh, community driven. And so um, a little bit about the Family Resource Center and, and how we got here. Um, so I know a while back, and I'm, I'm blanking on the exact time, um, I was here with Trent Gerrigs with the Cass Clay Community Land Trust. Um, we had an opportunity with a vacant lot right south of Romkey Park, um, and we were exploring an opportunity to do a multi-use building there in partnership with the land trust as well as Jasmine Child Care. A lot has happened since that, um, but really that opportunity was the uh, catalyst for exploring this family resource center model. Now that things have shifted with that project, the land trust is no longer involved. Um, Jasmine actually was gifted the land from the city of Moorhead using CBDG funding um, and made the decision to really focus on doing child care child care well um, and really being a partner in these ongoing conversations. Um, we went back to Sauer Family Foundation and asked for an extension of our grant and we were able to really reimagine what were the needs um, now that we were facing new opportunities. And so really what we wanted to share is really why the Family Resource Center and what is the data telling us. And so um, we have been working hard over the past year to just have conversations with partners, explore what this looks like. Um, we are very excited. The state of Minnesota has put a lot of interest in this model. There's actually a state network of counties that we are meeting with on a monthly basis. So we get to learn from other counties across the state of what works, what doesn't, what have they tried. Um, and really from the partners and the data, um, we have had more interest in Moorhead, um, just as there are more partners physically located here, but the vision is for all of Clay County. And so I just put this screen or the slide on the screen because this helps to illustrate why this is needed in our area. Um, when the statewide average 
for median age is 39, and in Moorhead it's 31 and 35, we are seeing we have more families um, and younger families in our communities. And then when we look at the poverty rate is almost double in Moorhead, um, we are seeing that we have a lot of young families in need, and that's exactly what the Family Resource Center is um, built to uh, support. <clears throat> Um, so, again, all of this is really based on national research um, through the National Family Strengthening uh, Network. And so um, a family resource center is truly just meant to be a community hub. Um, it utilizes multi-generation, strengths-based, and family-centered approaches. It's meant to reflect and respond to community needs and interests, so be adaptive as our communities change. Um, and really um, help build that peer-to-peer -peer opportunity for family connection. We know that connections in a time of need is one of the biggest protective factors that are missing in our families. And so, again, that is really what this center um, model is meant to address. Um, really how it's been connected back to social services is that there is a lot of research that shows um, that this really can um, help increase the five protective factors that families need to be successful and not have involvement with social services programs. And so that is uh, parent resilience, social connections, concrete support in a time of need, knowledge of parent and child development, and social and emotional competence of children. National research has shown that this model does have a very high return on investment um, when implemented, again, really uh, locally and to the local needs and um, uh, taking into account the local opportunities and really um, strengthening what's already happening. Um, this model is not meant to replace or duplicate any services that are already in place. We are really trying to coordinate and collaborate and then increase access and supports for families. A question. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I am on the Lakeland Mental Health Center board. So we had yes. a big update yesterday from partner counties that are doing um, similar work with the Sour Foundation grant. Um, the the challenge for me in this role versus what I heard with the folks in their role yesterday is Clay County is really unique in the way that we have family service center mm -hmm. <laughs> across the road and. And as I'm gleaning from what you're talking about, a lot of the need for connections and supports and family care and, and this, this whole family approach, um, what I'm struggling with is a lot of those supports and services are already provided across the road. And so, um, you know, how can you help me grasp um, when you talk about not wanting to reduplicate services and certainly as we're trying to um, connect with as many folks as possible for the given the money that we have yes you know how would that this model that you're talking about not exhaust the resources in the community but then isolate away from what we're intending to have folks bring to the yeah. center um i'm gonna go to this slide because i think this will help a little bit um and yeah definitely quinn uh jump in um one of the key components is more of that um space that allows for families to connect with one another and more of that social aspect. So like the community ed model? Yeah, very, and, and adult basic ed is a partner in this conversation and we're right. looking at, and I've got a, a graphic that'll kind of show what we're looking at because you're exactly right. We do not want to duplicate. We do not want to create just another space that's the same thing but really we are seeing a need for specific aspects and it's more around that social capital building, which is just not naturally going to happen within a space that a social service agency happens. There's that stigma and those barriers um, that families aren't coming here just to hang out and relax. Um, I would also say on the flip side, there's a security issue and staffing um, of just how that space is set up. And so we would definitely be in partnership, but um, looking at where are other welcoming 
you know, spaces that families want to are already naturally going to find connection to other families. Yeah, and the biggest thing that I would add to that is is that stigma. I mean, we want to create a welcoming, open environment as a family service center, but we still have kind of that reputation. A lot of what we do is reactive, and families can view it as punitive. And as much as the awesome preventative voluntary work that we do provide over there, there still is that stigma that comes with Clay County. So the, what's nice about a family resource center, or at least the model, is that it really can focus on that prevention side of things and kind of disconnect that from what can be the scariness of Clay County. So because I'm not around tables that discuss this further, mm -hmm. my question would be, why then would we not address that stigma by incorporating more of that into the family service center instead of creating something separate? You know what I'm saying? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I, think, I think we'll get to that in a couple more slides because we have feedback from both Clay County staff and partners and also kind of the, the vision that we've started um, nothing's solidified yet. We're working with a core team, and so this is Clay County Social Services, this is public health, this is um, school districts, um, adult basic ed, community ed, um, nonprofits, um, and uh, disabilities advocates, new American advocates. So it is a really diverse group that's helping us really vision what do we think will be the most successful, and how do we scale it to appropriately serve all of Clay County. One more thing to add to a, a large component of a family resource center is even something like the logistics, the operating hours. You know, our building is open you know, till five. We lock the doors at five. Mm -hmm. The idea behind a family resource center is families that are working all day can access that or utilize that outside of regular business hours. Um, so as you get into the, the logistics of the operations of what something like this could look like, um, even things like operational hours can. So how is that, if, how is that different than what Moorhead is building right now with the community center. How, how is this different than that? Yeah, um, some counties it is within the library and we, we haven't even got to like a physical space yet. We're really working right now on bringing partners together in a collaborative network. What is happening is there's a lot of siloing of resources and services and then it becomes a family's presenting in need of housing, right? Well, it's not always just housing that they're they're struggling with. It's a lot of things. And then it's, well, go to uh, Cap LP to get connected with housing. Oh, now you need to go to social services. Now you need to go to adult basic ed. And so really trying to make sure that they there is a better seamless process of getting folks to where they need to go and connected with the resources plus adding uh, capacity through a community navigator that is not tied to eligibility, program eligibility. That is one of the biggest barriers we consistently hear is that we have a lot of great community helpers um, with a lot of nonprofits, but they're usually tied to specific eligibility of the program in which they're funded through. So if they're tied to SNAP, they can only help those that qualify for SNAP. They're tied to housing. They can only help those that qualify for housing. And there's often these little barriers that the family might not quite qualify for that specific program, but they're still in need. And so really adding that community navigator role that can help those families better um, seamlessly access those services that are already existing in our community. And I think, I think I've got a couple slides that'll help this come together a little bit more. I'm <laughs> still setting some of the groundwork. But I really, um, what we've done over the past um, year is um, we have had conversations with all of the uh, Clay County Social Service Child Welfare staff. Um, we have presented to a number of Clay County partner providers. Um, I know we were a part of a mental health um, committee meeting. I know we met with um, a lot of the social service program providers. Um, we've brought this to um, groups like Inclusive Moorhead. Um, and then we had a really in-depth conversation with the Cap LP leadership team, knowing that what we're talking about really fits in line with a lot of the work that they are doing and wanting to grow towards. Um, following the conversations, which is really just kind of an overview of what is 
what is the Family Resource Center model. Um, we actually got all 15 Clay County welfare staff um, uh, certified along with 15 uh, community partners in the standards of quality. Again, just trying to help set a really solid framework so that we can all be speaking the same language around quality when we're talking about family strengthening services. Um, from there, we did a quality standards assessment with this uh, Clay County staff, um, a partner assessment with the partners that went through the standards training and then did um, some initial family assessments. And really what we were trying to use this towards was what is working well currently and what would a family resource center um, be able to add to that current mix. And so here are some of the opportunities for improvement that were identified by Clay County Child Welfare staff. So um, things that really what we would see are maybe currently not able to happen within the physical space or because of the um, more reactionary um, nature of the programming that is currently being provided by um, Clay County Social Services. And so really thinking about how do we enhance youth and family involvement in programming, uh, stronger diversification of community involvement. Again, this really leans into our network approach. Um, better family support, enhanced advisory, bilingual and diverse staff. Um, this idea of a welcoming or neutral space, again, when we think about stigma and coming into um, even just this area, knowing that everything is so closely together for a lot of families that have diverse um, lived experience and barriers, uh, a need for that heightened community navigation and then community partnerships. Um, when we asked partners what they wanted to see, they identified a lot of the same things that the staff had, um, and they saw the following opportunities uh, in addition. And so really that thought of the extended operational hours, where do families go or where do families call um, outside of the nine to five? Um, a peer support model, again, really the Family Resource Center is open to all families and when it is open to all families and all families are interacting, it allows for um, families to create peer networks so that they're learning from one another and the diversity of those families that are coming together really leads to better results. Um, Increase for support groups, um, again, that social capital, uh, meeting families where they're at, navigation, involvement of parents and youth in decision making, and organic relationships rather than the thought of transition or transactional interactions. And so um, we have created a core team, like I mentioned, this is a diverse partners who are really helping us to form or finalize our implementation plan. So we have really been in the, the data collection, conversations, hearing from families, making sure that we have the information we need to really create a plan that will, um, again, not duplicate, but meet the needs of families and builds towards sustainability. We do not want to create anything that's going to go away after three years. We want to make sure that if we're, we're doing this, we're doing it right, and that it will be sustainable while being flexible and nimble to meet the needs of families in our changing community. <coughs> and so really, this core team is doing a hard push this month to finalize um, and identify sustainable funding sources. Um, so we have submitted a state grant um, that would be three years for implementation. That grant does not require any sort of match. It is the state's um, intention to get these up and running in different communities. Um, the other option we have and we will be uh, applying for is the Sour Family Foundation. That is a up to two year development grant. Again, no match is required on that. Um, that will be uh, potentially a, a slightly smaller amount than the state funding, um, but still a significant amount for two years so we can uh, hire staff and actually get this off the ground running. I f 
in my experience, this is a very unique situation in which we have had um, a good lead time in this development process without requiring any sort of match. That will allow us the two or three years to really think through fundable or sustainable funding sources and making sure that we have a really good mix of revenues coming in so that it is not on one funder, one entity to make sure that this happens or doesn't happen. And so um, this is just a graphic, and I apologize, my handwriting is a little messy. We were kind of brainstorming. But really, in what we were discussing as part of the core team is how do we create this hub, whether it is a physical space or more of that mobile um, coordination um, that would be able to work later, uh, open on the weekends, um, work within spaces that are gathering, um, spaces already naturally happening um, that feel welcoming and inclusive to all communities, and then partner with formal agreements the entities that are already doing amazing work. What this allows for is outreach back and forth, better coordination and handoffs of um, referrals, um, and brings folks to, um, to services that are in need. Um, this hub, again, whether it's a physical location in the future or if it maintains more of that um, mobile model, will be really staffed by then um, a community navigator, a partner coordinator, and a family advisory board coordinator. Those are three roles that were really prescriptive in the state funding um, request um, and have been really shown to be the key roles needed to make this sustainable. And so really what we see, Clay County Social Services is the lead partner and the fiscal host. Um, again, that has been um, the request from both Sauer Family Foundation and the state um, because it is seen as a preventative model um, directly impacting the um, social service programming and um, referrals. Uh, at this time, again, there is no match for that. They are really just helping to support that. We have included admin time in all grants so that um, that portion of the fiscal management is covered. Um, the core team, again, those diverse partners would be collective uh, and collaborative decision makers. Um, the family advisory board, those would be uh, advisors and help support in family engagement. I know there was a question on this. Um, that again is paid through Sauer Family Foundation, the stipends for those roles. Um, that is uh, evidence-based best practices to have those positions be provided with a stipend. Um, both the state and Sauer were very supportive of that request being included. We um, are confident in the Sauer Family Foundation funding moving forward, um, and so, we would have that funding for the next two years and then feel confident that there are other local and regional funders um, who would be interested in, in continuing that moving forward. Um, Cap LP has been identified as the contracted partner to have the staffing for both the Family Advisory Board Coordinator and the Community Navigator. Um, they have a staff member who is identified with capacity who will be taking on that family advisory board coordination. Um, and then we are waiting on the state or Sauer family's um, next round of funding before we would hire that community navigator. And then our team would take on the role of partner coordinator um, and ongoing technical assistance for project management. Um, so then really through the extension of the current grant, which goes through November, we will be establishing that family advisory board. We'll be bringing them on boarded, um, providing them some training, um, and then also um, having them start to provide feedback and insight. We also plan to host a final community gathering to really release and share more broadly than um, just the core team. Uh, the final development plan um, come October and November of this year. 
So by the end of the year, depending on if we get state funding or just the Sauer Family Foundation, um, we will plan to hire um, those positions. As I mentioned, um, really the only position that would be hired as a new staff would be that community navigator. We've already got a staff identified for the partner coordination and uh, CAPLP has the staff identified for the Family Advisory Board coordination. Um, year one is really gonna be focused on strengthening existing partners in service delivery. Um, with our state grant, we did request funding um, that could be used for some of those partners. So if we identify that we need more uh, parent classes and that's not something we currently have enough of in the community, um, we, can, we can enhance that. Um, but really the goal is that we're better coordinating so that those programs are more utilized by the families that need it. Um, and that we're really thinking through where are these happening and how can we remove all of the barriers through partnership for um, existing programs. Year two and three would be to establish that formal FRC um, with consistent navigation services in line with family needs, including non-traditional hours, which right now is is a really big barrier and non-existent in a lot of current navigation services. Uh, Long-term plans then would be to continue to utilize that core team in the Family Advisory Board to um, maintain operations and continuous improvement, um, provide that relationship-based navigation services, um, continue to really hit it hard with community engagement and feedback, and then make sure that we're expanding outreach and navigation to all Clay County through that established partnership. Anything I missed that? <laughs> Any questions for us, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners? Any questions? Commissioner it, Kravinoff. It, maybe I, I do have I'm a sorry. Maybe. Oh, I'm, oh I, I'm sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> So I'll just uh, make a couple of comments as I've been in, what, three meetings now, I believe, uh, as part of the, uh, the, the core team. Uh, the one thing I'm really picking up on uh, that has made me um, quite comfortable with this idea um, is the fact, uh, uh, as we talk about um, going to, toward a community-based pre prevention model I think that's uh, uh, very important to think about. The other thing is, as we meet in that group, when I hear the enthusiasm with CAPLP uh, in particular, which I'm active with, uh, wanting to act as a navigator, wanting this community um, um, type um, way of getting resources out, let's put it that way, um, and, and when we got away from the physical model right now into a mobile model where we've identified different places, uh, in particular right now uh, in Moorhead to start out, but yet at the same time as we reach the Holly Barnesville, um, I, I just see a continuum of community uh, that really could separate itself from what we're doing right here uh, at the uh, service center. Uh, the other thing that puts me at ease, I guess, is the fact that it's all subject to state grants and sour grants. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no expectation from us uh, at this point, um, and maybe there, uh, maybe once we see if it goes forward, see some successes, you know, it will find those uh, local people to uh, bring that logo share. But um, that can come in different, a lot of different ways other than just a levy from here. So yeah, anyway, we're, I'm, I've become open to this and, and I guess in my last three meetings, I feel like I've uh, uh, see that enthusiasm. And, and again, to the school districts, I mean, there's just, it's more than CAP LP, it's a, it's a large group, so thank you. <laughs> in, your, thank you. in your uh, comments regarding the Establishing the Family Advisory Board, uh -huh. uh, you you made the comment that you would train them. Yes. What do you train? What what do you train them? What what? Yeah, yeah. It would be um, how to serve on a board. Um, we're anticipating that many of these folks maybe have never had that experience, so we'd provide them some onboarding. What does this look like? What is um, how to make collaborative decisions? How to make appropriate. Um, 
uh, recommendations, um, and then also on how they can help support um, further family engagement, and so that they feel really comfortable in their role. And I, just to follow up on what Commissioner Kravnoff said, I, you know, I know Rhonda had been talking about this for mm -hmm. a few years now, and I, mm -hmm. and I got the impression that uh, that she was kind of excited to talk more about this mobile concept. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really think that uh, we need to, I, I think just going out there in the future, when, when I look at the page about, mm -hmm. about the funding, and I want to be blunt on it, is that at some point in time, there's going to be a request for local funding. Yeah. Right? Yes. And, and the minute that comes to us, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'll say it a thousand times, that uh, when when it goes on to our levy, yep. you know, it's it's um, it's just a it's the worst form of, of having to collect dollars for for this type of thing. It's a it's a very regressive tax, and I and you know and I I certainly hope as as the long term planning for this mm -hmm. understands that. We need to find resources other than regressive taxes to cover those costs. Uh, even I, you know, I'm not arguing that some of this might be beneficial and, and improve some mm -hmm. quality of life, but at the same point in time, it can't be it can't be paid for by regressive yeah. dollars. And and the property tax levy is a regressive tax. Make no mistake about it. May I respond? Um, yeah, we. Um Part of our core team does include um, United Way. Uh, we are having conversations with West Central Initiatives as there's a lot of counties within their region. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing that I, I'm really excited about is the fact that we get to have conversations with our other counties to see, okay, how are you funding this? And there seems to be a lot of opportunity to um, use these next two, three years to rather redirect funding streams that are coming through the county. So um, one county that was uh, way far ahead of this is Polk County. They actually used ARPA funds to do this, right? So it wasn't a, um, a, a new funding. They just rather that's what they earmarked some funding they knew was coming in. Um, another county has used um, the homeless prevention dollars, um, again, to make sure that they could have another staff hired that um, really did help support increased access to homeless prevention resources. Um, I, I think that there, that's what I'm excited about is that we, we don't have to make those decisions today. We really get to look over these next two, three years and say, what are the funding streams that may be applicable? What are they currently being allocated for? What are we seeing as far as a change? And is this a good fit? Um, and then when we think about sustainability, it needs to be a really robust mixture of funding streams, not just one entity paying for it. We don't want it to be three years down the road, the county's paying for it or it's not happening. We want to have that good mixture. And I, and I understand these things are, you know, these are uh, new innovative ways of looking at um, mm -hmm. things throughout communities. An awful lot of it seems to me to, um, it, it seems to, geared towards and social services plays a big role yep. in all of this stuff. And with that with that in mind, you know, um, as you go through this process, is, is DHS, the state involved with some of these, um, you, you might want to call them pilot projects or mm -hmm. what have you, are they, are they involved in understanding all this stuff? Because some of them it's, you know, the discussion could be, we need to redirect some of those funds. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and that's what I'm hearing you say that we might have to redirect some of those funds. Um, so, so if if that's happening, is DHS involved with that? Yeah, yeah, I, I can speak to that. Um, that's why we applied for the state grant. I mean, it's uh, DHS is really supporting the model across the state, and I think that's why they've put some money set aside for this grant. Um, I can tell you when you guys hired me on this that I'm not a master of the budget, right? I, I was pretty transparent about that. I've learned a lot already, but within the next two or three years, I'm certainly hoping to get a better grasp on it. Clearly, Rhonda had a vision. 
Rhonda had a goal of what this looks like, and I'm, I've been playing catch up on this, but it is my hope that there is some sort of creative way within the budget that maybe we can, uh, through the conversations over the next two to three years with our community partners, maybe reallocate some of the mm -hmm. things that, that could make this happen. Um, I don't think that by itself is going to make this happen. I do think that there does need to be a significant investment at mm -hmm. the state level as well um, there you on go. something like this. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, I mean, which is why we wanted to go get that, or at least apply for that grant. It is a pretty competitive grant. I mean, mm -hmm. we're hopeful, but I think I, I think you said effort. a key component there, Quinn. I, yeah. You know, the, the, the state involvement and, and the state involvement you mentioned you don't want this to be a, a three-year deal and have to go away, right? Right. You, you, you want this to be able to move yes. forward. And and social yes. services in the state of Minnesota yeah. needs to be on board with that. Yes, and that's, I think, what is exciting is they have, um, there's a lot of conversations happening at the state. So there's a network of counties that are really helping to drive this conversation with the state. Um, we are looking at collective um, and consistent data collection and evaluation practices across each county so that we can really show impact to ensure that state funding is consistent because that's what we're hearing from the national network is that, yeah, it is a mixture of state local and regional funding that needs to come together for this to be sustainable long term. Yeah, I have one question, Quinn. Uh, we are taking an administrative role in this. Uh, I know there'll be some compensation, but is this something we can do with current staffing <coughs> without expanding the need uh, for additional staff? Yeah, um, the the idea would be that if you know if the grant funds are obtained, then the admin costs for the increased needs for reporting and things like that, we would we would account for that as well. I think right now between, pardon me, it would come out of the grant. Yes, correct. It would, it would come out of those funds to kind of recoup our costs. I think right now between myself and Susan, we've kind of we've kind of handled that. I'm not anticipating needing to bring anybody on with this uh, state grant or sour grant. If something were to change past that time frame, I would need to come to you guys or come okay. think about something. But like current that. staff is adequate to to address the immediate need. Correct. Okay. Any other questions, comments, Commissioner Mojo? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I apologize. I had to step out for a phone call, but um, you know, so if if my question or statement was covered, I apologize. But you know, in just in looking at the design draft and you know looking through. Um, key partners, I really, I really question how much of all of Clay County this is being served. It, it does seem really more head heavy. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the reason that I was maybe more pointed with my questions earlier is I feel like the goals for the services and the connections that you're wanting to have really do exist in Moorhead already. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like we are duplicating that conversation for services in this area. There may be a need for that in rural Clay County and in our other satellite cities. Um, but you know, just as I'm looking, you know, it is really pointed towards Moorhead perspective and Moorhead um, and partners. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that these connections don't need to be had. What I'm saying is I think they already exist. And um, having had, um, you know, I, I have brought kids to the, the WIC clinic in the Family Service Center, and I have sat through those um, discussions on, on healthy families and, and car seat safety and, and all of those conversations that have led to other connections for services in that building. And what I want to hear from staff and partners is how do we better utilize the services that we offer? not reduplicate that. So if I'm hearing that there need to be additional hours for families, which I get and I understand, does that need to be in another building somewhere else in the county? Or is that something that we can work through after our, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I appreciate the conversations. I really caution us as to exhausting services, um, mm -hmm. not services, funds. Um, when we're, if we're going to reduplicate things. Any other comments, questions? Anything closing or have we covered it? Oh, I, I appreciate the questions. It's all good things for me to, to, to consider and take into mind and continue to advocate at the, at the MAXA level too for the statewide participation mm -hmm. in this.
this entire project. And I, I, I do appreciate that this was on the agenda and have an opportunity to get an update on it. And I, you know, I, you know, I think there's uh, both some optimism and skepticism uh, built in here on this, and and uh, through, hopefully through through dialogue and some of the things that Commissioner yeah. Mozo expressed and some of the things that Commissioner Krabinoff expressed, we can get to the better end of both of those uh, mm -hmm. as we move forward. So, just one follow up. Thank you. I I know in the marketing messaging that's been going on as you gear towards those September October meetings. There was several updates that I saw that said Clay County is building. Um, please provide b feedback on, on the building that Clay County is building. That can't, I mean, then people see that and come to us, oh, Clay County, what are you building? Well, we are building a withdrawal management and a, <laughs> and a new DMV. And so as you yep. make those posts to the community, be very careful, because otherwise then it just assumes that this board has taken action, which we haven't. What, one thing I'd like to speak to at our last core meeting, we actually discussed kind of what branding and the logo would look like. Yep. I mocked up a couple different logos and things like that. And one of them said Clay County Family Resource Center. There was a significant amount of dialogue about mm -hmm. we need to remove the name, yeah. mm -hmm. Clay County. If, if part of the rationale mm -hmm. for this is the stigma that comes mm -hmm. with the Family Service Center that we need to work on, why would we put the name Clay County? Yeah. In? I, so we, I want to hear more about this stigma about the Family Service Center. I, you know, I, 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 not today. I, <laughs> but you know, we don't need to do it today. But I need to hear more about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, if, if we have a five-story building over there that's housed with 120 some social s service workers, and we got a bad stigma going on, mm -hmm. we need to we need to figure that out. Because mm -hmm. we're supposed to be there to provide services. Mm -hmm. And have, providing services and having a bad stigma, th those two don't sound good together to me. So I want to learn more about that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Next up, committee reports. And I believe we're going to start with Commissioner Mojo. Thank you. I do have a lot of committees from last week, so I'll try to be brief on those. If you have further questions, ask. Tuesday after, after the board meeting, we did have a um, scheduled meeting that um, Representative Keeler had scheduled to discuss our PRTF uh, strategy and discussion on uh, what Clay County's path forward for that would be. Um, uh, due to the announcement from Churches United last week, uh, Representative Keeler was at the Capitol and so was not able to attend most of the meeting. However, um, you know, certainly those discussions at the Capitol with, I believe, two commissioners um, were warranted. So Senator Kupek did join us. We talked at length about what that path forward and strategy is a bonding ask. Is it a, a general budget type ask? Um, how staff can help lift that project in collaboration with the both of them. And it, I think we do have a pretty good strategy moving forward. Um, certainly we've committed or committed dollars, but then had dollars on hold for planning and, and moving forward. But I think um, we'll continue to move boldly forward um, towards those proposals. That evening we had a long uh, August um, Clay County Planning Commission meeting. We did have an IUP request for crane um, operational business in uh, south of Sabin that did um, get approved. We had three requests for solar uh, solar farms. Um, one change is that in the past we have certified or granted permits for one megawatt farms and if you drive throughout the county they are they're up and running which is really exciting. Um, we approved one megawatt farm application and two five megawatt farms. And so the difference, if you recall, we talked when we created the ordinance is that Clay County utilizes revenues from the taxes generated from the um, wind towers. And anything, any solar farm that is one megawatt or under does not um, generate that tax that filters down into to the counties. So the big change now is with five me two five megawatt farms, we will start the ability to collect on on that. And um, uh, we did not have any community 
input that was negative towards that. So we're really excited about that opportunity. We did then have a application for an IUP for a batch plant in southeastern Clay County. We did have a long, long discussion on that. That project specifically would be um, a two to three week project that would um, send all of the asphalt into a project for Richland County. Um, there was a lot of concern from the Planning Commission on the deterioration towards the road, particularly if it wasn't generating, um, utilizing material from that plant. We did uh, find out that it would come from another Clay County plant, so, or another Clay County pit, so there would be some gravel tax generation on that. But, but really, um, when you're looking at the benefit to the Clay County, to Clay County, and then the detriment to the road, particularly to the Hall route throughout um, pretty, uh, several residences, we did deny that permit. I did have discussion with the project manager following that meeting uh, to get creative to see if there was a better fit for a location on a batch plant, either in Clay County or if there's something in a Wilkin County. So I think they are working with a Wilkin County um, uh, pit to see if that would make sense because it, that would that would basically run two trucks or a truck every two minutes, Ezra, a truck every two minutes out. That's not even accounting for the material coming in or the, the uh, stuff coming back. So you'd have a semi every two minutes on County Road 2 all the way across Clay County um, to 94, so or 29, sorry. So we did deny that permit. Then we, the next day, I had the Red River Basin Commission Joint Powers Committee meeting. We did have an update from Eric Jones from Houston on the distributed detention update projects throughout the basin, and then had an update on DNR mapping from um, Andrew Graham from DNR. It's always a really good uh, meeting to discuss projects throughout the entire basin. I attended the Solid Waste Budget Committee meeting, or it wasn't, I don't know if it's a committee, but it was a subcommittee, I guess, with Rev with Commissioner Campbell, myself, uh, Steve, and then Corey from Solid Waste, just on the budget, grasping a hold of a couple different items that we needed clarification on before the full request comes forward. The next day I attended the SWAC committee meeting. We had an update on um, recycling and program updates, landfill <laughs> updates, and then Commissioner Campbell gave an update on Prairie Lakes. The next day, or that same day rather, right after the meeting we had a um, annually we review the contract for the Resource Recovery Center with the City of Moorhead representatives in Clay County. Um, talk about the budget, any items that we see happening. Um, Clay County or Moorhead provided us with the entire amount that um, it cost them to operate uh, the resource recovery center. And then, um, you know, certainly we had ours as well. Um, talked a little bit about snow removal coordination. Um, I really appreciate the partnership there. And then that afternoon, I attended the MCC JPA meeting, uh, large update on the property acquisition status reports and litigation action summaries. Um, we did approve a relocation reimbursement request and um, took action on three acquisitions um, and then also approved three appraisal reviews. And then there was one lease extension on a property that um, due to a house move needed to be pushed back just a little bit. Um, certainly those are difficult to coordinate with all the different partners that need to do that. And then that evening I attended the Cap LP uh, meeting. Um, we had a almost one hour meeting. <laughs> what? Sorry, do you need me to oh, pause? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I forget something? No. Oh, okay. No. We had an almost one hour discussion on the Churches United um, issue, and I really appreciate Senator Kupek being there. It was a really honest and raw conversation about how, how all of us who um, provide services in so many different ways mitigate that issue and, and how we all have boards to respond to and auditors to respond to and, and who is best to help um, help in a capacity. Lakes and Prairies provides an enormous amount of supports to at-risk families and individuals 
and um, they really aren't in a position to um, or have the staff capacity rather to shift and take on such a large project so they'll just continue to help in the ways that they can Senator Kupek was really appreciative of all the different uh, representatives and, and organizations that do such hard work. Um, but I had talked to um, Steve earlier, who had talked to Quinn, and and there's there's about two hundred fifty thousand dollars that Clay County. That's not the total, but Clay County is contracted with churches to provide housing supports, and um, there needs to be um, some documentation that comes with that. Um, so. Um, there's about $250,000 in revenues that churches could utilize from Clay County through that contract through DHS. Um, we're the host for that. Um, should that uh, reporting happen, and um, certainly that uh, Clay County has provided ARPA funds, um, uh, over $100,000 in ARPA funds to churches and provides that support in that way. So um, everyone's trying to um, figure out the best way to support. Um, helping them realize that $250,000 I'm, I'm hopeful will be a large support for them. And then we did, um, th there are several openings on that. Our chair for that board has um, been hired by CalPLP, which is an exciting um, continuation of the mission. So we will um, have a couple board openings there. Uh, or Commissioner Kravinoff was there as well. So if I forgot anything, he can update that. Then yesterday I was in um, Alexandria at the Lakeland Mental Health Center office. We did have updates from all of the Alexandria and Glenwood supervisors. Um, good updates on the community needs and behavioral studies. They've now ex they will be expanding through themselves or through partner organizations. Um, a presence in all of the Douglas County schools, which Clay County has always said is such a huge thing for us. So exciting for them to have that opportunity. Talked about um, adding the drop-in center and how there are challenges and opportunities, but certainly that drop-in center provides <coughs> such vital supports to the people in which utilize it. Um, we talked about the gaps and what are you know what are the gaps for families and and when you have to when you learn the skills for mitigating a behavioral health or a mental health um, illness when you have to wait 9 to 12 to 18 months for a placement you know is it really that that helpful so what are the larger needs as we discuss um, at the state what those gaps areas are so i appreciate um, how they continue to um, look at where the needs are and how we um, collaborate and create um, opportunities to try to meet the needs of the majority of our communities. So uh, we did then have a closed session after that, and um, we did give an update on the Moorhead business or Moorhead building project October 1st. They won't be moving into the new um, renovated site, and they are um, on time and still have eighty thousand dollars remaining in a contingency. So as you know, that's always good. And we will move into negoti contract negotiations soon. And that concludes my reports. Thank you, Commissioner Campbell. Thank you. <clears throat> On August twentieth, I sat in for Commissioner Gross in the PIC meeting, and I'm going to defer that report to our board chair, who was also there. I'm, I may have some additional commentary to his report, but we'll see how, how that goes. And then on Wednesday, uh, as Commissioner Mojo mentioned, we did have a subcommittee meeting with Solid Waste to, um, to go over uh, some budget issues. Uh, there was, uh, Corey had mentioned that he might wanna bring something up along with SWAC, and we were a little bit concerned about um, where we were with, with the budgeting process at that point in time, so we had a a significant conversation about the budget, which raised some additional questions. And then, um, at which we'll, we're, we're meeting again today on that. Uh, as a matter of fact, Corey had originally intended to uh, present his budget to this board today, and, and we've asked that to, to go back a week, I believe it is. And we're gonna have, we're gonna fine tune that uh, so that we, we know what we're gonna be requesting coming up here. Uh, then on the, the 22nd then, we did have the um, SWAC meeting, the Solid Waste Advisory Committee meeting. 
Um, there's, we continue, uh, Shannon uh, Thompson gave a nice report on the recycling programs that we have there. And we did talk about, um, you know, the lithium batteries just seems to be a conversation and the education, the importance of the ed education involved with um, the proper way to dispose of those. Uh, Corey gave updates on both the landfill and uh, landfill activities and the overall solid waste activities. Um, as may have, what's been reported to this board in the past, uh, we are still having issues with the overhead doors in that facility. And we're at the point now where we're basically saying we need to have new doors installed because there just doesn't seem to be the appropriate fix. And so we're, um, Corey is working on that. And of course you get into those large garage doors and there can be an extreme amount of waiting time. And we're concerned about having those properly installed and working properly before winter sets in so that that's going to be a challenge in itself. And then as in terms of um, the responsibility there, that's going to be an, uh, an ongoing, you know, there's always somebody, uh, everybody seems to point their fingers at somebody else's and uh, being the problem. And ultimately it should not be Clay County. That's the way I'll put it. So, um, that same day then we also had a, uh, Mord Clay County Joint Powers Authority Board meeting. That's in regards to the diversion project. Commissioner Mojo gave a, a good report on that. I really don't have anything to add on that at this point in time. And then at, at uh, 3.30 that same day, we also had our diversion board of authority meeting. At that one, we, get, we have our uh, usual updates, uh, several updates on... on um, issues and then one of the we had two closed sessions and out of those closed sessions one of the items that we uh, that the board did take action on was the um, an employment uh, agreement term, termination agreement with the former executive director Joel Paulson and it basically uh, dealt with an agreement based on the amount of um, available uh, time he had remaining for vacation and sick leave and that type of thing. So that, that was a process that went through and that uh, both parties have signed that agreement and that should put an end to that discussion. Um, then uh, yesterday morning, I attended the West Central Regional Water District meeting in Halstead, and I want to thank Ezra for uh, joining in and kind of uh, keeping update up to date on what's going to be going on. I'm, I'm, the assumption is that he will be taking over that role on behalf of the county in, in January. And I want to thank uh, Commissioner Krabenow for also being there, kind of uh, taking the place of Frank, Commissioner Gross for the day to also, and I think you probably were even enlightened on some of the stuff that goes on there. Uh, the, the big thing that came out of that, you know, and of course we're, we're really close to the filing with the district court. For, for there's, a, there's going to be a uh, virtual hearing on September 13th, which I plan on attending on behalf of Clay County members. And that's just to kind of get the process going where, where the, hopefully the court will establish the first public hearing part of this whole um, concept that goes on. And, and I also want to mention too, I want to thank um, Don for, for being there as well on behalf of Clay County. He, last time he attended virtually, but this time he was able to be there in person. What a dumb. Um, and, I, and I do want to mention that, uh, boy, I tell you, uh, Don has really kind of put both feet in right away because he's already uh, been in contact with Cent West Central Initiative on uh, some uh, some additional funding opportunities that we have in this this whole setup process. So I was really impressed with what he's uh, his knowledge about the, these different agencies and how they can be helpful. And uh, so I was I was quite impressed with 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 that. Uh, I did one of the things that I did bring up is. 
when in the court filing it establishes, we're asking the court to establish the board and it's by individual and by each county. And one of the questions that I, that I had was, well, okay, now I, if the court has to appoint these individuals, what's that process gonna be moving forward? Are we gonna have, it, like, for example, like Commissioner Gross is on there right now. In January, his term is done, he'll have to come off. Every time that happens, you know, over, over the life of this thing, are we gonna have to go back to the judge and get their approval or, or appointment? And what, so we tried to, uh, so Dan Marks, who's the attorney that's working on this on behalf of us, he's gonna try to incorporate in there where the judge would allow that to happen uh, outside of the courts by just letting each board uh, up make those appointments. So, so we wouldn't, but, but as it stands right now, we would have to go to the court every time we had to replace somebody. And then we're talking, at least for right now, maybe about the ability to have an alternate. Um, I, I think long term after this is established, I think, I think an alternate will probably go away. Similar, like right now when we appoint people to the Buffalo Red Board or the Wild Red, we don't really have alternates. You know, so I think ultimately when, when this is established, the idea of an alternate might not be, be right, but in the setting up of this, to, if we have one county board member who can't be there, we should be able to have another one be there in the establishment of this. So that, that's the purpose of that, so. Uh, and you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of really good work going on there. We've we got uh, some reports on additional funding applications that are going on. Um, And I guess that's, maybe Paul would like to add something, but that concludes my report. Thank you. Commissioner Kravinoff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I uh, was at several meetings um, that have already been mentioned, but I'll just give a couple ads. Um, so on the 20th, um, I was part of the small group with uh, legislator uh, Legislator Kupek and our small group regarding the PRTF. Uh, one thing we are waiting for is from our pro potential uh, provider with PRTF, uh, getting um, the ability to find out what the word entity, entity means uh, in putting this uh, PATRF uh, in, in the juvenile center. So uh, we'll wait for a federal uh, um, comment on that and then we'll continue moving forward. But I think it's important we uh, began identifying people we might bring in, uh, other legislators and other groups and, uh, you know, um, we have such large county support on this uh, that to <clears throat> bring that narrative uh, to the uh, other legislators so we get a good collective message out there. Um, creating the need for this down the road and, and expressing that mainly um, not only th to bonding folk but to uh, DHS uh, directly. Uh, that afternoon I had uh, a uh, finance committee with CAP LP. Um, everything's in good standing order on their fi finances each month. Uh, they have good cash flow, been receiving sizable grants to keep their uh, operations running smoothly. On the 21st, I, I also, through the uh, Stuart Cultural Society, had a finance committee meeting, uh, <coughs> two parts. Uh, we received our annual audit report from Red Mirror Roll, went down that in through de full detail. Everything's good standing. Uh, a couple minor uh, concerns in the audit only uh, that really can't be overcome. Uh, uh, and that's the size of staff being able to look at all the, um, in handling the checks and, and those type things, oversight. But again, that's something that's brought up every annual report. So um, no real concerns there. We went through our July financials and um, we're at, in very good shape. You know, we're in that time of the year when admissions are high and we've received our grants. A lot of gift sales are at all time high. So cash flow uh, with the uh, um, uh, uh, HCS is very, 
uh, very good at this time. Uh, the next day, Thursday, uh, 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 we had another uh, FRC core team meeting. And uh, again, the presentation by Megan and Quinn this morning, I think, really reflected everything I've been seeing over the three meetings I've been part of. And I appreciate the, the openness and the discussion we'll be uh, having as we move forward with this. Um, those two core meetings will be occurring uh, w once a month. And I plan on being at all those, uh, um, if possible. And and again, we'll. Um, uh, I'll just add. I, I look forward to our fall conference when we're at the Arrowwood in September. We'll have AMC there. Um, they promote you know this model every time we're together. So I hope maybe to answer uh, some of the concerns or you know maybe it's not a concern getting the state involved in this you know with DHS. What not? Maybe we can get a deeper discussion going on that, and really see. Uh, maybe I can hear a little more firsthand where where they're at, and then report back to y'all. Uh, the uh, that evening I had the Cap LP uh, board meeting. Uh, Senator Mujo, you you did a great job in reporting on on the um, discussion we had regarding that relationship with the Cap LP Churches United. And again, and even to Clay County Services, you know, we we're, we're active in providing, you know, supportive services, and that's our role. I think it's very difficult for a place for uh, I'll speak now back to Cap LP to be running an organization like this when they don't have the staffing, nor do they have the expertise um, toward that area. Um, Tiffany Ross was our uh, current chair. Uh, as mentioned, uh, she took a job with Cap LP, so she's had to step down from chair as vice chair. I guess I'm the chairperson now of Cap LP. And along with that, I'll, um, uh, as <coughs> by her also stepping down, I'll now be the chair of the collaborative. So a couple of things changed with her leading, leaving. So a little more involvement there and, and things I look forward to uh, serving. Um, Let's see. And then, uh, I guess, finally, to yesterday. So on Monday, I uh, had a couple of meetings. Again, uh, Commissioner <coughs> Campbell mentioned about the West Central Regional Watershed District. I did enjoy the conversations there. Thank you, thank you for all your input and leadership uh, with that group. Uh, I sat in uh, for Commissioner Gross on that, on that uh, committee for that day. Um, then, um, in the afternoon, I had the Cash Clay Food Commission Steering Committee meeting, and um, we'll see where things go. I, I, the Food Commission, um, uh, Cass County, is uh, re-looking at all their budgets. Uh, you hear that all the time on, on the news quite a bit. Um, the uh, the uh, money that had been given through grants to uh, Cass County Public Health um, seems to be uh, uh, getting scrutinized and maybe want to be used in other directions. Uh, we do have a MOU, of course, with uh, uh, with Clay and and uh, and Cass, you know, toward the uh, Food Commission, and so we'll see what the responses are as they move along. And uh, but there is concerns about, you know, the money that's been funding this is. Um, we don't know exactly how it's going to all end up, but I know it's um, it's going to be a, um, it may be a challenge uh, to move forward the way we have been. But I don't want to get too far ahead. But it's a concern. Um, with that, uh, we will be having um, our food commission meeting, uh, which we have new two new fire com commission or uh, uh, commissioner Strand will be coming on, and then uh, Commissioner Amy, um, gosh, um, uh, Commissioner from West Fargo, I'm gapping out the last name. But anyway, two new uh, commissioners coming on the Food Commission Board. Uh, coming up on September 11th um, at the Fargo City Chambers. With that, that's my report. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I just do have one follow-up. Commissioner Mojo. Thank you. Uh, last week after the SWAT committee meeting, we did, uh, I was asked by um, staff to look at a 
field access approach that was next to our new DMV facility, it was identified that that had been substantially changed and did then eliminate the access for that farmer um, to get his crop off or their crop off. Uh, so Commissioner Campbell and I have been working with staff on um, getting that back built back to the access in which it was. So there uh, will likely be a slight change um, from the contingency requested from this board to do that. But um, as stands, um, there's a corn crop in there and there's no way to access it. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, last Tuesday, the 20th, uh, I attended the PIC meeting. Um, Quinn Jagger uh, from uh, had an overlap he, he's going to request involving a an intake employee that's been there 35 years was it kevin i think 31 years I think. 31 years huge amount of institutional knowledge and he wants whoever her replacement is going to be upon retirement to have an overlap period where uh, can bring up her the person who's taking her position bring her uh, on board so that'll be coming to the commission here shortly. And then Darren Brook discussed a UKG system uh, for recruiting and onboarding that will make life a lot simpler for our department directors, for everybody involved in hiring, where you'll have one system that is uniform and, and uh, effective. And that'll be coming to the, to the agenda in the near future as well. On Wednesday the 21st, had the Diversion Authority Finance Committee meeting, um, covered the usual business approval bills, finance report and cash budget report. Um, also, uh, Shelly Carlson, who's on the, on the board, presented a, uh, a summary of the Minnesota contribution to the board, or to the uh, Diversion Authority, about 52, a million at this point uh, that was in response to some questions raised by uh, Commissioner Pipcorn over in Fargo about what the Minnesota contribution was I think she gave a good effective answer on that it was also uh, she did the same thing the next day at the full board meeting uh, earlier that day I had a phone com conversation with Karen uh, Strachan of the state auditor's office referenced the county's audit just some of the boilerplate questions I ask at all audits. Uh, the following day, Tuesday, the 80, uh, 822, had a similar conversation with Partnership for Health exit meeting on their audit. And I spoke to a couple of people from the state auditor's office just in reference to the partner for Partnership for Health uh, budget and how it was, it was handled. Later that day, we had the Diversion Authority board meeting which Commissioner Campbell covered well. On Monday the 26th, the Dancing Sky Special Meeting, um, we had a remote meeting that was called to bring board members up to speed on some pretty deep cuts in Title B, D, and E funding that's available uh, for transportation, for uh, elder meals, for a number of things. And we have bids out right now that uh, are still being uh, in the process of collected, see what kind of uh, costs we're going to incur with the meals programs that we've got in this region. It is potentially it's going to be a very hard impact on our seniors in the state with the the cutbacks and the programs that have been identified so far. But uh, they provided us with some information, some which can't be discussed right now because it's involving bids. And we will have a November meeting where hopefully we can close some of that out. And that completes my report. Steve? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And last uh, Tuesday, I participated in the PIC meeting that's been well covered. Um, also participated in the PRTF uh, discussion with Senator Kupek and Representative Keelers and members of our board. Uh, again, uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate the insight coming together uh, to kind of as we've shifted here our our plan a little bit uh, to, to see that we still have that support. Uh, that afternoon, talked to uh, Klein McCarthy in regards to the pre-design uh, for, uh, for a non-secure uh, facility and uh, potential remodel of the existing non-secure facility for a PRTF. 
Uh, again, I'll probably wait to bring that forward until we hear from hear from Mr. Summers from Solutions on on whether that building uh, has to be a standalone or not. Um, uh, that afternoon uh, or morning, I also met with uh, Quinn and Commissioner Kravinoff in regards to a series of different issues. Again, just want to uh, I think thank this board. Uh, for the efforts that they've put uh, they, in, in looking at solutions and discussing Churches United. I know that uh, you view it as a value of committee, uh, our value to this community, uh, and you have many community assignments that, uh, that touch, uh, touch that, uh, that building. So uh, solid waste uh, budget discussion that's been well, well addressed on the 21st. On the 22nd, participated in the SWAC meeting and then the subsequent meeting uh, for the annual contract review and, and annual budget review with the city of Moorhead for the resource recovery facility. Um, continue on with uh, having uh, several NACO leadership sessions, uh, virtual sessions uh, last week. Uh, participated in the MCC JPA meeting, which has been uh, well discussed. Uh, had additional conversations with Quinn uh, that afternoon in regards to Churches United. Uh, with the 22nd, um, had a solid waste budget meeting, uh, or budget discussion, uh, follow up with Lori and Corey uh, for our meeting this morning. Um, 23rd, uh, met with Kimberly from the recorder's office. Uh, we just talked about uh, maybe some uh, future future legal advice. Uh, she currently uses a uh, an attorney who has notified her that he will be retiring uh, here in the f near future. <laughs> Uh, and while it doesn't uh, take a, a, a number of cases per year, uh, there is a need for to fill that void. Um, just a couple other things just to note. Uh, the uh, empty pesticide containers are being collected uh, at the landfill this week, 8.30 to 4. Uh, and so uh, please participate in that uh, if uh, possible. Um, I uh, Just a note, uh, yes, yesterday or last night, the just a, a note, our communications department continues to provide updates that our DMV is going to be located at the Morton Center Mall and our, our DMV is, is uh, uh, new buildings completed, which we are tentatively have as uh, October 21st. Uh, I, our communications group has, has uh, put almost weekly updates, but there continues to be questions. And I would assume with the city of Moorhead now vacating uh, to move into uh, the former U.S. Bank, while their building is remodeled, uh, there may be more questions. And so we'll continue to try to keep uh, up to date. Uh, the last item I just wanted to bring forward is uh, the Lands Committee. Uh, Matt is looking to bring forward a meeting on September 10th, I believe, after uh, our board meeting. Uh, Commissioner Gross is, is a part of that. That was, as Lands Committee is not something that meets on a routine basis. And so I was just reaching out to the board for their thoughts on adding a second commissioner uh, to that meeting uh, in a couple weeks. I believe I'm, I, we did discuss and, and I'm gonna attend that meeting. Okay, all right. I'm on that committee as well. Yep. All right, uh, I believe that concludes my report. Hey, Brian, Darren, Sarah. Well, everybody's quiet. Okay. Well, if there isn't any other additional business, we'll adjourn. <laughs>